Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to subscribe with your favorite podcast software so you never miss an episode. You can subscribe using Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Stitcher, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. Our famous investigator t-shirt is now available. You can check out this great design and purchase yours by November 29th by going over to famous.greatdetectives.net. And that's by Christmas in the United States if you order by November 29th. Now, let's get into this week's episode of I Hate Crime. This is episode 73, and it originally aired in 1950 or 1951. Let's go ahead and take a listen. I hate crime. I was standing on the GPO steps at the corner of Martin Place and George Street. It was a windy day. Perfect for watching the dames go by. When I felt a gentle tug at my arm, I turned and looked into the biggest bluest eyes I ever saw. But they were frightened eyes. Mr. Larry Kent? That's right. Oh, I thought I recognized you. We've never been introduced, have we? No. I mean from your photos in the newspapers. I've just been to your office. Business visit? Yes. I... There's a lounge on the corner. We can talk there. Well, what do you want to talk about? The corpse. That's always an interesting subject. So, we went up to the lounge. Ordered. Sipped at our drinks. And then I figured it was time to get around to our dead man. I asked her where he was. In the living room of my flat. How did he get there? Well, I have no idea. Sure he's dead? Yes. Ever seen him before? No. Well, why didn't you call the cops? Well, I... I wanted advice first. Finish your drink and we'll see what has to be done. I... I don't think I want any more. She looked as though nothing would go down. If you've ever seen anybody getting seasick, you know what I mean. We went to my car. As I drove along, she told me her name was Cleo Lane and that she ran a travel agency in town. She lived at Koala Flats, 23 Ralston Street, Rose Bay. It was a poshy joint with two flats on each of three floors. Would... Would you go in first? Okay. He's just over... What's the matter? He's gone. We looked all over the joint. Under the bed, in her wardrobe, the cupboards, the other rooms. Every place but under the carpet. But the body was just there. Less than an hour ago. You said you were sure he was dead. Yes. What made you sure? There was blood all over his back. Then there should be some blood on your carpet. Wait. There was a small throw rug. He was lying on that. Where is it? But but it's gone too. (laughs) Don't believe me. Listen, sweetheart. Was all this a trick to get me up here? A trick? You think I... Of all the colossal egoism. There's the door, Mr. Kane. Okay, okay, okay. So it wasn't a trick. Would you kindly phone the police, Mr. Kent? I did. Getting on to my old pal, Inspector Daniels. When he arrived, he listened to Cleo's story. Skepticism showing over every inch of his ugly pan. But, like a dutiful little public servant, he scribbled it down the particulars on a notepad. Now, Miss Lane, a description of the, uh, corpse. Well, he... 
It wore a blue suit. Did you get a look at his face? I could only see half his face. I'd say he was... I had been very good looking. Age? About 40. Height? Rather tall, I'd say. Six feet? Perhaps. It was hard to tell from his position. Anything else? Oh. Uh. I'm sorry, Inspector, no. One more thing. Are you quite sure you saw this dead man, Miss Lane? Inspector, if you think I suffer from hallucinations or delirium all treatments... All right, all right, all right. I just thought I'd ask. We'll investigate and see if a man answering to this description is missing. If anything develops, we'll get in touch with you. Thank you, Inspector. Good morning, Miss Lane. See you later, Kent. Here, yeah, Inspector. Well, Mr. Kent? You want me to go, too? I wouldn't want to keep you here under false pretenses. Look, I... I'm sorry about what I implied. It's quite all right. No, but it isn't. I, I'd like to make up for it. How do you intend doing that? By asking you to go out with me. Will you? If I accepted, you'd uh, probably think I invented the story of the body for that reason. I wouldn't care if you did. Oh, look, there was a body. And if you believed your own publicity, you'd try to find out more about it. Well, what do you mean, my publicity? Well, that, that slogan of yours, I, I hate crime. Where have crimes been committed? Now, hold on, hold on, gorgeous. I'm taking your word for it. I'll follow it up if you give me half a chance. Oh, that's different. Do you know the guy who lives next door to you? Not very well. His name is Marx. Yeah, I saw that beneath his doorbell. Leo Marx. What does he do for a living? I don't know. Well, if he's the same Leo Marx I've heard about, he's the business manager of a nightclub, the Blue Angel. If he is, will you go there with me? All right. Later, by means of a discreet phone call, I found out I had the right Leo Marx. So, at eight that night, I picked up Cleo. You're right on time. If I'd known what I was going to see, I'd have been there earlier. She wore an evening gown that looked like it had been grafted on. Color was back in her face, most of it natural, just a bit of lipstick and powder added. Absolutely nothing else was artificial. Ready to go? I snapped myself out of my daze and escorted Cleo to the car. Then I drove to the Blue Angel. For a minute I thought I was in the wrong place. The girl in the check room was new, so was the cigarette girl, the waiters, even the band. We got a table, ordered, started to dance. We danced some more. I, uh, I hope you're not forgetting about the body, Larry. How can I? I mean the dead one. That's what I thought you meant. Larry. What's up? That man by the door. The tall one? Yes. That's George Randall, owner of the place. His face. What about it? It's the face of the corpse. Corpses don't come to life and walk around nightclubs, even though some of the patrons may look like zombies. I got Cleo to sit down, poured a drink into it to stop her shaking, and then I caught Randall's eye, inviting him over with a nod. He accepted with a smile, held up one finger, and walked over to a man at the cloakroom counter. That's Mr. Marks he's talking to. And he's looking towards us. Does Mr. Marks know you? 
He should. I've been here often enough. Here comes Mr. Egg. Hello, Mr. Kent. Everything satisfactory? Yes, thanks. I'd like you to meet Miss Cleo Lane. How do you do, Miss Lane? I hope you're having a nice time. I am, thank you. Good. Oh, won't you join us? If you allow me to buy a drink. That's the general idea. <laughs> He ordered a round and gave out with a small talk. There was a V-shaped scar just above the right corner of his lip. I'd noticed that scar once or twice before, but it hadn't been quite so livid. It might have been the weather. Sometimes the scar shows up more when there's rain coming. A doctor told me that once. Randall stayed at our table for ten minutes or so and was then called somewhere else. At midnight, I took Cleo home. Still say he resembles the dead guy you saw in your living room? Yes. You must think I'm a psychopathic case. No, but Randall is certainly no corpse. But I... I, I could swear he was the man I saw. I'm not doubting you, Cleo. Now, here's the situation. You find a dead guy in your apartment. An hour or so later, he's gone. The character next door to you works in a nightclub. The owner of a nightclub looks like the corpse. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. No. And that's why we're not taking any chances. As soon as we get to your place, you're going to pack. Pack? Yep. Then I'm taking you to a certain hotel. Why? Because I like you, Cleo, and I want to make sure you'll be around for a while. I felt better after I took Cleo to a hotel. The peck she planted on my cheek told me she appreciated my... my help. It also told me I was making at least a little progress. I ordered her to sit tight and not to go to her office in the morning. Then I drove to my apartment and went to sleep with my thirty-two under the pillow. In the morning, I had a cup of coffee and a phone call. Larry Kent speaking. Daniel's here. What's the good news, Inspector? You find that corpse yet? Not the one that went for a walk. A new one. New one? Yeah. I want you out here at 23 Ralston Street right away. 23 Ralston? Who got it? Leo Marks. There was a cop on duty at the entrance to Koala Flats. He recognized me and waved me through. Upstairs in the hall, the first thing I noticed was a hole that had been cut in the thick glass on Cleo's front door. I asked Daniels about it. The killer broke in there, too. Or oh, Miss Lane made it look as though he did. Her body's not inside. Thanks to my hunch. You? Yeah, I took her to a hotel for safety. You know something, don't you, Kent? About as much as you, and that's the truth. Where's Miss Lane? The Apex Residential Hotel. I'll go and see her. Oh, she'd like that. How did you find the body? Mark's cleaner woman came at eight in the morning, let herself in, and went streaming down the street. The fellow across the road found us. Uh-huh. Can I go now? Where to? Looking for information. If you get some, you'll pass it on to me, won't you? Why, Inspector? Don't I always cooperate? On your way, Yank. I went to a dirty little building in a section of the city that the Chamber of Commerce doesn't want to know about. Larry Kent. Hi, Bluey. There. Come on in. Like, uh, something on your mind? Yeah. George Randall, owner of the Blue Angel. What about him? That's what I want you to tell me, as much as you can find out. Well, it might be odd, you know, because 
He ain't never been the sociable type, you know. Yeah, but he got rid of his whole staff at the Blue Angel. One of the old staff might like to talk. They probably won't be able to say much, even so. Yeah, I can try, I suppose, eh, hey, for, a, you know, like a little, uh... <laughs> little yeah, uh, yeah, here. Uh, a fiver. It won't get me very far. It'll get you far enough. I'll be in my office at four. Ring me there. Okay. When I left, I drove out to the Apex Hotel. Cleo was waiting for me. Inspector Daniels was here. I know. Mr. Marx is dead. Yeah. Probably because he knew too much. About what? The missing corpse. Inspector Daniels told me that my flat was broken into last night. Uh-huh. If you hadn't brought me here... We wouldn't be talking. Thank you, Larry. A pleasure. You're nice. You're not so bad yourself. Mm. You, uh, sure you didn't kiss that corpse? That'd bring anybody to life. Sit down. Yeah, uh, I could use a chair. How long do I have to stay here? I don't know yet. Have you left the hotel for any reason? No. I've taken my meals here. Good. Keep it that way. You're taking such good care of me. Like I said, I want you to be around for a while. Just a while? A long while. I've uh, got to go now. So soon. Have to. I'm expecting some information. Take care of yourself. I want you to be around for a while, too. A couple of minutes later, I went to my car. When I got to the office, it was half past three. I spent the next hour thinking. When you look at a puzzle, you try to figure out all the angles from the evidence on hand. Then you reject the impossible and keep the possible, no matter how fantastic it may seem. That's what I did until four. Larry Kent. Larry here. What did you get? Saw Billy Brennan. The old bouncer from the Blue Angel. Yeah. Here's what he told me. A week ago, Marks gave him a few bricks and told him they wasn't using the bouncer no more. But that's a lie. Because Billy says they got another bloke called Paul. Do I know him? I don't think so. He's new. Hanks is Randall's bodyguard and he's always somewhere close by. Uh-huh. Hey, wait a minute. He's something else. Yeah. He's a dummy. He can't talk, can't hear, but reads lips. Well, that's interesting. But didn't you get anything about Randall himself? Only this. He comes from no one knows where, and he's got to sit there three years ago. And he doesn't have a friend in the world. And that's all, kid. Thanks, Bluey. No friends. No one knew where he came from and a scar near his lip that suddenly grew more noticeable. Little things like that told a lot when added to other things. I went to see Inspector Daniels and told him a story. He liked it. Then I waited till 8 o'clock and went to the Blue Angel. Randall made an appearance at 8.30. I threw him a signal and he cruised over. Yes, Mr. Kent. Evening. Is everything uh, satisfactory? Yep. But I'd like to have a talk with you, Mr. Randall. Mm. Very well. Alone. My office? Okay. It's just over there. Too bad about your... Business manager, wasn't it? Yes. Oh, poor Leo. He was a big help to me. Yeah, here we are. After you, Mr. Kent. Thanks. Now, what is it you wanted? 
Remember when I called you over to my table the other night? Yes. Why did you talk to Marx before you came over? There was something I had to tell him. You mean you asked him who I was? <laughs> That's a foolish thing for you to say. I've known you for years. I don't think you do. And I don't think you're George Randall. Why don't you? That scar. This? I had it since I was a kid. George Randall may have had it that long, but the scar on your face is no more than six months old. That's quite right. And this is a gun, Mr. Kent. Yeah. I recognize it. Stand up and turn around. Okay. Hmm. Here we are. Ah, a thirty-two. Nice weapon. Pity I must get rid of it. Like you got rid of Randall, huh? Yes. Incidentally, my name is Randall, too. Peter Randall. His brother. Twin brother. Oh, this is Paul. I summoned him by pressing that buzzer. He stared at Randall's lips because he was reading them. This was Randall's bodyguard, the dummy. Paul smiled and kept looking. We will take care of Mr. Kent in a moment, Paul. Show him your sharp little knife. Pretty, isn't it, Mr. Kent? He knifed your brother. Yes, he's quite good at that. You see, my brother was supposed to be calling on Marx. Paul was waiting in the hall. He did the job. Then, because he isn't very intelligent, placed the body in the wrong flat. And you discovered the error. Yes. Why did you kill Marx? Well, he helped me with my scheme to impersonate my brother, for a large sum of money, of course. He heard me practicing George's voice, saw me cut my face so I'd have George's scar, and he helped arrange George's death. In short, he knew too much. He was dangerous to me. Cleo Lane could have been dangerous too. Yes, but she was not at home when Paul visited her last night. However, we will see to her later. Shall we go? If you say so. Paul. Paul. He's looking at you, Mr. Kent. Ah. That's right, Paul. Look at my lips. Now hold the point of your knife at Mr. Kent's back. Good. If he tries anything, give a little push, eh? Do you understand? I will. Fine. I will open the back door now, and then you will walk ahead of me. We will go to the car. Hi, Dad. He closed the door and bolted it quickly. No wonder the back alley was full of cops. Down the door. Drop it, Randall. As Inspector Daniels entered with three men behind him, Randall froze. But Paul wasn't looking in that direction. His eyes were on a spot on my anatomy, and the knife was ready to come down. He posed like a statue, a very surprised-looking statue. He didn't hear the gun, but he felt the bullet burn, and he went down like a Californian redwood. And there you have it. Randall told his story and would undoubtedly get his neck stretched. Me, I made a phone call. Harry, hi, a kid. You can come out of hiding now. It's all over. Uh huh. You can go back to your apartment. Sure. I'll be at the hotel in fifteen minutes. Can't you make it sooner? There was something in her voice that got me there in seven minutes flat. Huh. Funny life, this. You hurry, 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 and then you take your time. Good night. <laughs>
Welcome back. Well, I'm glad to know that Larry Slogan is getting around. Although I should add that hating crime doesn't necessarily mean you have to solve all crimes for free. The mention of Larry sleeping with a gun under his pillow raises some questions for me. It's one of those things that's in the story that doesn't actually pay off. Oh, he's telling us the gun is under the pillow because somebody's going to come into his room. No, that, that doesn't happen. But I wonder about the practice. First of all, it does seem like sleeping with the gun under the pillow would kind of mess up your sleep and the benefits you should get from sleeping on your pillow. I also wondered how advisable it was, and I did some searching and I found a blog post by Larry B. Smith on the topic. In the blog post, he spends uh, quite a bit of time advising how to mitigate the risk inherent with doing this, but he's not a fan of it. Arguing that it doesn't make sense from a standpoint of being able to use the weapon since under a pillow it could shift or mow. And keeping it loaded is a definite no-no. Uh, he writes, if you sleep with a hot gun under your pillow, you are gambling with your life. The gun can discharge if it is dropped during the night. Don't rely on safety in these situations. It doesn't always work. The fact that your safety isn't working won't be acceptable in the court if worse comes to worse. And he says that if you really need a gun uh, to be nearby when you're sleeping, uh, then there are better options. He writes, place it in a fixed position relative to your bedding. <laughs> It doesn't matter whether you keep it on the nightstand, in a holster, in a hidden compartment fitted to the headboard, or velcroed to the side rail of your bed if it's in a fixed position and is easily accessible. And that, to me, makes more sense than sleeping with it under the pillow. But then again, who said that everything Larry Kent does makes sense? Now... Even though there were many more episodes of I Hate Crime, we're running out. We only have three more episodes after this week's show. And in four weeks, we will bring you Sarah's Private Caper. And as we only have one episode of that series, we'll then begin our new playthrough of Dr. Tim Detective. Now let's go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Frank, Patreon supporter since January of 2021, currently supporting the program at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Frank. And that will do it for today. A reminder, if you're not subscribed to the podcast, you can do so using your favorite podcast software, including Good Pods, Spreaker, Apple, or the Amazon Music app at Amazon.com slash OTR Detectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, please be sure to rate and review it wherever you're downloading it from. We'll be back next Tuesday with another episode of I Hate Crime, but listen to Dangerous Assignment tomorrow where... There was nothing in his pockets, huh? No tape, if that is what you mean. Well, I guess we can't fight on anything more here. Brother, his clothes sure look... Like they took a beating? Yes, they are quite scorched. Yeah. You see how the sleeve pulls away in your hand? Debrick. What is it? Look, wrapped around his arm under the sleeve. Ah, a fragment of tape. Yeah, just a fragment, but maybe it's what we're looking for. Come on, let's get a recorder and play it. I'm ready, Mitchell. Let her go. Very well, I will start the machine. Nassif, you know who this is? Good. Now listen carefully. The meeting will be here on Thursday night at midnight. I... Just a minute. There is too much noise. There. I closed the window. Now your job is to get the necessary equipment. Do you understand? Hmm? Do not tell me you are getting faint-hearted, Nassif. Of course, many will die. That is the plan. <laughs> the Americans will be blamed for it. 
And do not let me hear any more of your stupid fears. Uh, one more thing. Contact the other party involved and have him telephone me for his instructions within 30 minutes. I will wait here until 10.30. There... That's all there is of the tape? Yes, the rest was burned beyond use. Oh. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.